What's going on? Chris Vettieri, how are we doing today? Well, how are you? Um, today is a fantastic, fantastic day. Got some great news yesterday. Uh, my son is coming home. Been in the hospital a couple of days. Nothing major. Uh, just some routine uh, checkups, and they wanted to make sure everything was balanced out. But uh, Aiden Richard Mastriani is on his way home uh, this afternoon. So after this podcast, going to pick up my daughter. Uh, she's at her aunt and uncle. So uh, Phil and Michelle, thank you very much for uh, taking care of Ava all week long uh, while Jenny and I uh, were taking care of Aiden. Uh, going to pick Ava up and then uh, we're going to head over to the hospital to bring Jenny and, and our child home. So very excited. <clears throat> nice. Congratulations. Yeah, for sure. For sure. How How's your weekend been so far? Uh, it's good. Did a little uh, volunteering with my mother, and um, now we're having some family over. So nice, nice. What what type of volunteering do you did you do? Uh, at my mom's church. They have a food drive, so we hand out food to uh, some less fortunate families. For sure. Basically. Well, that, that's very that's very generous of you, Chris. So thank you for your volunteer work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what's been going on in the Tra- Travelers Championship? I saw Phil Mickle. I, I've been so busy this week. I, I really haven't even had a chance to watch. So I'm going to lean on you heavily here uh, to tell us what's been going on in Travelers. I, I believe Phil Mickelson uh, went into moving day with a lead yesterday, last night and, and today right now. Yeah, I don't have too much to report because I was crazy busy at work yesterday. But, yeah, Phil had a crazy good two days. Uh, He was winning. Mackenzie Hughes, uh, I believe he was one back. He had the low round of – he had a 60, which was crazy. So he was one one shot off from a 59. Uh, He's no Jim Furyk, but he he did have a crazy good round. Um, And then you got, you know, a bunch of the big names up there. Bryson's up there. Dustin, I think he's minus seven. Um You know, Zach Johnson's minus eight. Rory's at minus nine or something. I think he's minus nine. And then Zander Shoffley. So you got a lot of good names coming into Saturday uh, right within striking distance. That's great. That's great news. And I'm happy for Phil Mickelson. Phil, uh, as we we spoke in an earlier episode, on the wrong side of 50. uh, You know, I just wonder how how much longer after he's he's been putting it up for, for quite some time now, how much longer he could you know, stay up there and compete. I mean, he's a pretty tall dude. I, I went to the president president's cup a couple of years ago when he was in Jersey city at uh, Liberty national over there. And I, I was, I have a close up video. I was able to get within like five to 10 feet of, of Phil Mickelson. And he, he hit a shot. I think it was on, it was probably one of the last played holes on, on the course. And it's where they did the trophy presentation. But as we were walking there, Phil, uh, I guess sliced one off of the tee uh, it almost went behind the grandstand. It was up on a hill, and I just happened to be on that hill where the ball landed. So I had a great perspective of him. But he, I mean, he's a pretty tall guy. His bone structure, he looks super athletic. Like, he doesn't look that athletic on TV. But when you see a, a professional baseball player or a professional football player, or any professional athlete for that matter, there, there's just something about their size and, and their bone structure and their athletic, you know, uh, physique. Uh, that is different from everybody else, which, you know, gets them to that point. And Phil still looks like that athlete. You know? Yeah, I mean, over the last year, year and a half, Phil's also been on a fitness kick and he's gotten uh, definitely back into shape. So especially now, he's definitely, uh, I'd say, five years younger than he was last year. Um, as far as how long he's able to play, he – can still drive with the best of them. You know, he's never been the top dri- accuracy driver, but he can still hit bombs, like he says. And I think the other word was salacious stingers or salacious something. Yeah. Um, Came and spelled. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, and his short game's always been up there with the, you know, top five in the world. So until I think he's mentally out of putting in the effort, which he probably has to, to keep up with this level, I think he's got at least, you know, three to five more years uh, competing heavily on the tour. Yeah, that, that's, that's good. And, and it's always good. Uh, Phil is good for the game, you know, just like uh, LeBron is good for basketball and, and Steph Curry is good for basketball. Um, 
he, he's that person who, who's the leader within the PGA. So having him at the top of the leaderboard always draws a bigger crowd, whether it's in attendance, obviously not this year, or just on TV. Uh, so you're just going to have all the all the you know big time Phil fans checking in, uh, even if they're casual golf fans. If they're big Phil fans, they're going to be paying attention every year. For him. So it's good for the PGA to have him up there. Um, so Chris, how's your where you know I, I want to say we're about six to eight weeks now into New Jersey's uh, relaunched golf season, right? So we had COVID nineteen. How's your your personal season been going along so far? Um, I usually at this point have about, I want to say 20 rounds in, Mm -hmm. usually I end up in the mid thirties to low forties, which my wife will probably kill me by me saying that. But yeah, I'd say, I think I only have half of that at this point. Um, this year I made a decision. Well, I was about to make a decision. Uh, everyone around us was getting fitted for clubs and it definitely helps. Um, it's an investment because when you get fitted, you're paying a premium. Uh, you know, they're adjusting the lie angle. They're adjusting the loft. They're extending or, or shortening, uh, irons. They're also yeah. trying to reduce spin. Like they're actually tuning it into your golf club. But what I was really, uh, hesitant about in fact i even went to start to get fitted um i was hesitant because i didn't want to put a band-aid on a few things that i know are wrong with my golf swing and it's i know it might be weird me saying that but because i'm a like right now my handicap or my index is a 3.8 but i really want to get to the point where my swing is as good as it can be and then get fitted for that swing and i don't want to put a band-aid on something that I could fix with lessons. So I was going to, and you know, to answer your question, yeah. I was going to get lessons and invest all that money in lessons. And then next year get fitted for clubs. Uh, that obviously then COVID happened and I was not able to do that or play as much. So um, on the positive, I'm still playing, you know, my standard mid seventies, high seventies, uh, but I definitely haven't, improved except for one area which is distance um that was one of the things is to lower my my spin on my drives and my long irons and get a little more distance and i've done that so how about you that that's um um, i I think i have some questions on on your game first so going you said you mentioned you you wanted to get some lessons or is that still the case do you still plan on getting lessons this year at all so Yes, I would like to. Uh, I have two pros that I'm talking to. They're actually one is my neighbor, and what's his name? Uh, Steve. Can we give his last name? Or, um, I actually don't even know his last name. <laughs> well, the other guy is Mar- Marty. Uh, I, I it starts with a V, V Y B O H A L. He's the Preakness. Um, uh, He's the Preakness pro, and he also... And he's, you're talking about Preakness Valley out in Wayne, yeah. over there? Yep, yep. Yeah. So he's the pro over there. Uh, he's, he lives two doors up from me. So Marty and Steve are the two guys I've been talking to. Marty more, um, but he's just been kind of inundated with getting the courses open, and he basically told me we have to wait till July. So... I'm kind of waiting till he's open to it. I do plan on getting lessons. Um, I've also, as you know, been kind of diving into an Instagram account with giving lessons and just the research on giving good information. I've actually learned a bunch of stuff. And, yeah. So what's the name of your Instagram account? Uh, it's first cut underscore golf. Very good. Yeah. So um, every, everyone, Chris is a, uh, I'm not sure if you know, Chris, keep me honest here you're the assistant coach for don bosco prep in your first year unfortunately uh the season was canceled uh but chris has a like he said he's a 3.8 handicap uh he's an assistant coach at a uh a, a pretty high level athletic high school uh, in new jersey i think don bosco prep was i'm not sure what their status is in, in football anymore but for a good run i want to say maybe 10 plus years Don Bosco Prep was not only the dominant powerhouse in the state, 
they were the dominant powerhouse in the country. Um, I, I think my cousin, the years that my cousin Sal Mastriani played there, um, he, I, I don't think he lost a football game. Uh, I think they won two national championships, four state championships. Uh, and, and he just has these giant rings to prove it. Sal, Sal's best sport was ended up being wrestling. Um, he, he was a defensive player in football, but he was a, ended up being a all American, all state uh, wrestler. I think his senior year he was thirty two and one, and he, you know, lost in uh, lost in the finals, but ended up going on to uh, Virginia Tech, where he ended up becoming an all American uh, wrestler there. So uh, I, I know with that status, the baseball team's always pretty solid. How's the the golf team been at over at Don Bosco? Yeah, they're overall pretty good on all fronts. Uh, they actually went to the state championship in hockey. I think they lost. Uh, I want to say the states. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, this is my first year, so I might have. It might be conference or states, but they lost in whatever championship round that was. And the only reason in I know hockey. that is, yeah, in hockey, yeah. a lot of the, a couple of the hockey players came to tryouts the next day, and they were kind of down on on losing that, but. Yeah. Um, and golf, they were pretty good. Uh, I know you just from the seniors, you have, I think, one returning senior that I know, or, or two, actually, and they're both going to go to college to play golf. You know, you have this one junior. I'm not going to name names because yeah. they're younger, um, but he's about my height, probably could hit 50 yards further than me once he dials in his short game. You know, he's still shooting. You, 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 um, compete on nine holes so when i say scores they're always going to be half of what you normally get um but he's shooting you know high 30s mid 30s even under par some days so they have a really solid team the other coach also was a uh, coach of the year okay. uh last year i believe his name was gerard ross um really good guy he was teaching me about kind of you know it's different because originally before this season, I was going to be Caldwell's uh, assistant coach. Um, that's actually how, where originally I got hired. And they called me up and they said, and it was a volunteering position. I was just excited to do it. And they called me up. They said, listen, there's a paid position, Don Bosco. More more importantly than the money was, you know, they're kind of level. It's, it's a much more elite uh, private school. So... Gerard kind of was teaching me how to stand back and give more uh, mental advice because all these kids have swing coaches. So it's kind of hard for me to go in and start messing with their swing when, you know, you're paying some guy $200 an hour to teach your kid how to swing properly. That's right. So I was more there for the mental aspect and kind of a game plan when you go into certain courses. For sure. For sure. So, it uh, sounds like you have an exciting team that you're taking on over there and to be a part of that and just to get out and immerse yourself in something that you're passionate about outside of just playing with your friends, but actually really committing to, I mean, other people's lives and influencing your aspect of the game onto, onto other people as well. That's, uh, that's super awesome, Chris. Uh, love to have the coaches over at Don Bosco on the podcast if we could get them over sometime. So happy, happy to uh, invite them in here. Yeah, the, the the head coach is actually a really interesting guy. He was a lawyer. He retired, uh, you know, just to spend more time with his family. And now he teaches law at uh, Don Bosco, or I forget what school. I think he's at actually a different private school. But he teaches law now, and you know, he's obviously was the coach of the year last year. So I'll try to That's get him. Fantastic. That's cool. That's good stuff. Uh, going going back to your approach to this season, so you're going to start taking lessons in July. How are you gonna? How are you gonna? Somebody with a three point eight handicap. If I had Chris, if I got down to a three point eight handicap, I'd start giving my own lessons. I think I wouldn't. I, I don't think I'd be that passionate about making my score better. I think I'd be really enjoying the game. What are you thinking about in terms of going into a, a lesson and and really kind of having somebody pick apart something that you've been doing your whole life now? Yeah. So it's kind of. It's kind of tough because I know what I used to hit and f as far as distance. So everyone talks about distance now, Bryson. Um, and I've been – over the last couple of years, I've been playing with some players that are much further hitters than me. The only reason I can score better is 150 yards in. I'm 
you know, I can hit a green pretty much all the time and I can either two putt or chip within a couple feet. So what I really want to get back to is I shallow out too early. And when you shallow out a club, it means you're dropping your shoulder. So your back, your back shoulder, your back shoulder. Yep. Yeah. So your club is kind of stuck behind you. It's called getting stuck. Mm-hmm. And in order to actually not chunk it or slice it, you're basically flicking your wrists through the, to, to square up the face. And what that does is you lose a lot of distance because you're, you're not using your, it's like if you were to throw a ball on your knees versus versus like crow hopping almost if you crow hop you're going to throw it double the distance from yeah, your... I, I would even say like bare handing a ground ball like when you're charging in from third base and then having to throw it without having to lift your body up right right like yeah there's... throwing it from like underneath like where you know you're losing all that power that you're getting from from your legs exactly yeah you know you hit a baseball it, every sport almost has the same motion you know javelin throwing a ball tennis racket golf like they're all the same motion pretty much you gotta your your hips are pulling the club or your hips are pulling your arm to pitch down to to home plate yeah that, so that, that, that's that, my biggest um that's my biggest thing now I, I work on not doing that and I know when I'm doing it because of it's pretty easy. The numbers will tell me uh, the problem is, is when I get to a point where I'm not doing it is I don't have the control that I do when I do do it. So it's a trade off. Sometimes I can drive, you know, I can drive it 300 yards, but do I really want to risk a, you know, 40 yard hook or a 40 yard slice when I know I can drive it to 50. So my numbers, if I just strictly go by numbers, I can, I can usually shoot 75, 76 with my current swing. What I'd like to get to do is the ability to pick up more birdies and have more opportunities for Eagles birdies and uh, tap in pars without the penalties and and Um, and for you that means being within 150 off the tee on a par four probably yeah but you know how we've talked about bryson and having a gap wedge in versus seven iron it's kind of the same in in my perspective um i play in a couple tournaments outside of the fast company ones where we are playing 6800 yards or 6900 yards which is a lot different than when we play because we play from the whites to kind of cover the whole field which is fine um but when you're playing at 68 to 7,000, if you hit a 280 yard drive you might still have 160 170 yards in so every yard below that really matters um so at this point are we looking at your and you think you could get that extra 10 yards out of the current clubs that you're using uh yes, I have I have uh, Title S A I have Title S A P twos. They're really good clubs. Uh, you know, honestly, I really should even wait two two or three years. Uh, and I think if I was able to trap it a little more with a little more club speed, I would get the ten yards easily. Um, I think that if I did get fitted for new clubs and reduced the lie angle, did a lot of the band aid things, I could also get that. But that would be my ceiling. I don't think there's much more I could do past whatever that point is. So at least if you fix your swing, then get fitted, your ceiling is much higher than just getting fitted. So fixing your swing, then get fixing your swing, then getting fitted is going to be your approach. Now, are you going to are you going to be fixing your swing, working on your lessons this year, this summer actually, and then? I mean, how how quickly are you going to get fitted? Like, if you become comfortable with your clubs, would a fitting make you more comfortable? Or like, I'm just trying to figure out. Sometimes, it yeah, seems I like think... at some point, like you should be doing lessons, then getting fitted, and then continuing your lessons. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're you're spot on. I think once I get to a point where I don't think, where I think I'm hitting it as well as I can, I will get fitted. And then I would like to keep getting lessons to maintain that because honestly, 99% of the golfers that go and hit, go to the driving range without a plan. And they're just, which I'm completely guilty of as well. You know, sometimes it's just stress relief. 
I, I wouldn't even, I, and I'm glad you brought that up because I wouldn't even know how to go to the driving range with a plan. I pretty much, if, when I'm going to the driving range, if I do, pretty much if I'm playing, if I'm hitting a golf ball at some point, I'm just like, you know, it's screwed. I'm just going to work it out on the course. If I were going to the driving range, my plan is usually, um, I used to just be like, hit it straight, but at the driving range, it's pretty wide. So now I pick two points and I'm like, uh, either I'm with irons, I'm trying to hit the flag, but with a driver or, uh, you know, longer clubs, I'm, I'm trying to put it in between two very specific points, like on the net somewhere, right? right. In the back there. That, and that's the, that's the beginning and the end of my plan, right? Um, and maybe get a feel for my gap wedge and my sand wedge off of, you know, if there's a mat there, that sucks, but off of grass. And that's, that's pretty much the beginning and end of my plan. How, how many people know how to write a plan? And I guess, you know, for the sake of, you know, time, what you're going to the driving range, what does your plan look like there? I mean, I work on a couple of specific things. Uh, there's a couple of drills not to shallow out. Uh, there's also a couple of drills to focus on driving your left foot in for distance. Uh, if you're a righty, driving your left foot down on your uh, downswing. Yep. Uh, weight shift. I also have alignment sticks. Um, you know, I, I've also been golfing for like 32 years. So I've, I've been part of a bunch of lessons. Um, and I think the two bad things you could do is number one, go without a plan. And then number two, go thinking about a million things. So sometimes I'll just go and work on my grip and just whack a couple balls and play around with my grip. Cause there's no perfect grip. There's, there's what Ben Hogan says and, you know, Arnold Palmer and there's weak grips, there's strong grips, there's uh, top, you know, Dustin Johnson has a different grip than Rory, who has a different grip than JT. So how do you say which grip out of those three are the best of them? Yeah. Um, it's kind of what works for you within your swing. But I think it's trying a bunch of things and making sure that they're fundamentally correct. So to answer your question, I don't think many people are qualified to write a plan. So I think really it's good investment. I mean, even if it's just three lessons a year to get a couple lessons and ask your instructor, like what, what should I be working on? What's like two drills I should work on. And, so you know, so to, get, to get into the, the details there, looking, you, you know, my swing pretty well, right? We've played quite a bit. There's times where you're like, Rich, that was a great swing. Holy shit awesome shot there right like sometimes I, I i feel very proud when i impress chris with a shot um and then there's other times where you're like that was a horrible swing but somehow you hit it straight or that was a horrible swing and that's why it's 40 yards to the right uh, if i were going to the driving range let's say over the next three weeks once twice a week what type of plan um or what what would what aspects of the game would go into that plan well so like I, I always say this to people when they ask me, the first thing I would say is I'm not a professional trainer. I don't have my PGA card. So I'm just going by what I say yep. with your swing, you're athletic and you're strong. And I think you kind of picked up a club one day and started playing. Right. Pretty so, much, yeah. so you're basically initial thought was I have to turn my body, your body, in your club are almost always on the same plane. And the reason your drives and don't go further and you sometimes might slice it is because you're basically very uh, rigid. So it's almost like a whip. If you had a whip, you have to like lag it back and then snap it. Right. Yep. yep. So if you could learn and it's kind of hard to explain how to teach that. And I, it, there's a couple lessons you can do, but if I were to do a couple things is one, I would have you drop the clubs and I would have you swing a, a ball, like a weighted ball. And if you swing how you're like one normal, of those devices with the orange ball at the end of it, like, like that. No, no, device. just like, it's like a, like a, a weighted ball that you throw down, you know, like you do a squat and you throw down. What are those called? A kettlebell. Yeah. But the kettlebell has a handle, right? Yeah. Yeah, just like a you know the rubber ball where you do a squat and you throw it down as part like a weighted uh, sack almost. Okay, like a, a medicine ball type thing. Right. Yeah. Right. It's like soft, but it's heavy. It's got some weight in it. 
Exactly. Yeah, so- I would have you swing that, and that will give you the feel of how, and then try to push it and then throw it forward as hard as you can. If you swung it how you swung a golf club, you wouldn't get very far. But if you swung it how you're supposed to swing a golf club and kind of lag it back and throw it, you can get probably 20 more feet. So am I looking at um, am I looking at like a 10 pound medicine ball, or a 20 pound medicine ball? Uh, for you, um, it's a good question. I don't remember what I used to use. Okay. I would so- say I would say start with a 10. You know, throwing a 20 pound medicine ball might get tweak your back but yeah, if it's I'm too gonna light go with the 20 i'm gonna go with the 20 <laughs> okay. definitely definitely gonna i'll try the 20 i'll i'll, I'll go down before i um this gotcha. guy, I, you know uh, uh, the 20 will definitely make me stronger i'll catch up to it i'll just feel like a, a, a you know like it's not doing anything with me for the 10 pound ball there um so subscribe to high bait society fast company or first cut golf on instagram um, i'm gonna post some of the medicine balls that i'm aware of uh, that i know of that you could probably get uh, delivered. I, I think they go somewhere between 30 to 40 bucks. I, I might be wrong on that. Don't quote me, but um, just, uh, you know, off of Chris's uh, direction here, getting a feel for the club, um, you could, you could certainly just swing a ball or throw a ball at a wall and that'll give you a good feel for what the club should feel like if you've never got a lesson before. Um, so Chris, yeah, th- thanks for the insights there. Going back to um I mean, going back to just golf in general. Um, so we're, you're going to get your lessons this year. We're going to complete the season. You're playing in the Fast Company uh, golf tournament tomorrow. Um, you're when you do go purchase your clubs. What's that process look like hmm. altogether? So late back in the day, I would say maybe five years ago, beyond. You were never, you know, getting fitted for clubs wasn't a thing. I, I never heard of it. It was it was something that pros got. It was something that elite players got. What you would do is you'd go, you'd put a piece of tape on the bottom in the face, and you'd adjust your line goal based on that. So if it was too far up, the, the marks, you'd adjust it back. Like uh, lead tape or like, like no, tape? No, no, like masking tape. Yeah. And you would just see how you're hitting the ball, basically, from that. So now... You can see swing. You can see swing angles. You can see spin. Spin's a really big one. You can see uh, smash factor, which is basically a ratio of I think club head speed to ball speed to something else. Um, and depending on your smash factor, that takes into account a bunch of things. So I think the two biggest uh, things to look at, which any person that's getting you fitted will know these these numbers, but smash factor and spin would be my two that I would focus on. I have a pretty high uh, spin angle, but my process now, like if I were to be six months from now and really happy with my swing is I would go to one of the facilities um, that, and I I would do, I would do some research uh, and with reviews and everything. Uh, I would make sure I have a deal first of all, because you could save four or 500 bucks off the bat with, you know, if you buy the clubs through them, you don't have to pay for the fitting. Um, I would make sure that that was the deal before I got fitted because you could probably rack up a four or $5,000 bill pretty fast. If you get, you know, your putter. Club fitting. Yeah. If you got a putter wedges, irons, three wood or hybrid, whatever, and a driver, I would say without a discount, you're looking at 4,500 bucks. Whereas if you go to golf galaxy and you just pick stock shelf, everything, you're probably looking at three thousand dollars, or you know, maybe fifteen hundred bucks less. Yeah. So if I if I wanted to buy off the rack, let's say my budget isn't there. Okay. Let's just say I've been playing golf for a year or two, or my clubs, for example. I have these uh, uh, tailor-made burner clubs from who God knows when, right? They're they're certainly at the end of their their lifeline here. Um, but if I was to purchase, if, if somebody needed to go out and just get a set of clubs like that, that were somewhat forgiving, how, how, do, how do you know what, there's a ton of different shafts out there, like just off the rack alone, right? There's different irons, there's different types of irons, they have cavities behind them. How am I, how do I determine, what, like, what should I, I don't want to get a full customized set, but I just want to get a, a set for my own to start golf and get out there on the course or just lower my score from, you know, a hundred to, you know, 90 over the next year. Uh, what, what am I, should I go in and, and get that, that, 
that swing analysis or what, what does a golfer do at that point? So you're saying you're shooting, you know, a hundred, you want to improve to a 90, you have not a huge budget. What should you do? Yeah. No budget for, yeah, no, but you don't even have your own clubs yet. Yeah. What, what, what should, Oh, what you should, don't have your own yeah, clubs. Yeah. I mean, you need clubs. So yeah. the first thing I would do is, um, I would probably get a used set, honestly. Just, so if any, I just was, any set and start swinging. It doesn't even matter. Well, I wouldn't say any set. I wouldn't. I mean, technology improves every year. So I would get like a one or two year old used set. Uh, you know, make sure you have standard loft, standard everything. And I would then just start swinging. There's not a lot you could do without clubs, right? Yeah. If you had clubs and they were five or six years old and you wanted to improve, I would use the money that you did have for some lessons. And then after you get to a point where your game is improving enough, then go to, then get some nicer clubs. Um, but I would incrementally go up because you're not going to go from a 90 to a scratch golfer in a year. It's just not it, maybe one person in the country will, but, or very few people will, but most people will only improve five or six shots a year. Let's say if you're practicing, um, I really am a proponent on getting lessons, getting the fundamentals down, practicing, and then improving your equipment. Yeah, for sure. With that being said, if you're playing with 12 year old, you know, 14 year old burner irons that, you know, you had in high school, a new set will improve uh, immensely. You can see with what Phil, Phil has this year. I mean, he didn't switch a single thing. He didn't have a lesson. He didn't do anything. And he's hitting his irons 10, 15 yards further just by new so, equipment. So he's got that. He, he went in, got the full swing analysis, got that customized set um, completely tailored to him. And, and rightfully so. I think Phil's biggest problem this year is he's hitting his irons and his driver so far and he didn't he didn't know what yardage to use or which club to use right so i think he's tuning that down and getting a pretty feel for it i mean i'm gonna put him in the favorite for for group a uh coming out he's you know it's you ronnie ronnie from new jersey phil landoffi and, and rich paldino who rich paldino is rookie of the year if he takes this tournament uh <laughs> but uh, i'm gonna put i'm gonna put phil out there for the favorite Okay. Um, he's been hitting his club so good, and he, uh, he's got this knack. I don't know if the draw is really going to come into play at at Wild Turkey. It's kind of a quirky short course. Maybe there's a couple holes, but he's been hitting this nasty draw, like 280 yards. Um, I, I mean, I haven't played with him in a week or two, Chris. So, uh, love to put you up on the challenge. I, I think you owe me uh, a steak dinner from um, the Charles Schwab Championship. So, why don't we put that on the line? Um, not saying that you have to win the tournament, but you certainly have to beat Phil in points. Um, I'm, I'm going to start dinner. losing. A, I'm going to start losing a lot of money here. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the deal: if you if you win the the if you beat Phil, if you if if you just outperform Phil in terms of points, uh, we'll split the dinner instead of you paying for it. Um, if you win, um, I'll if you win. Hmm, if you win the tournament, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm, I'm, not, I'm not willing to give up the dinner, but maybe I'll just recent the, I'll just get, meet match the dinner a second time um, where right. I'll, I'll pay for another dinner that time. Yep. We'll, we'll figure it out. Well, uh, I honestly, because my handicap went down, obviously. So I think, what am I this week? A two? Uh, I have to look at the chart. I haven't. I haven't spent a time. I haven't even sent it I out think, to the team. Yeah, I think I, think I submitted it too. So yeah. I, I'm gonna have to play like pretty much scratch golf to get under my handicap. So we'll see how that goes. For sure, for sure. So uh, Fast Company's Freedom Invitational Tournament is tomorrow. I think there's going to be some weather conditions, which uh, favors the better golfer. Um, I always feel yeah. whenever, whenever the ground is wet, I mean, the greens are certainly softer, um, but whenever the fairways are wet and if you miss hit just a little bit, you end up, you know, taking up a bit of turf and, you know, you, you just, there's less room for error. I feel like for, for a gobbler like myself, I um, love, love watching people struggle in weather because no one knows, like 
that's something that you will learn as you play your whole life is how to adjust for weather, wind and all these things. So the, the one of the hardest shots for people is an 80 yard wedge shot when the ground is soaking wet. Right. You just see yeah, everyone yeah. chunk it and it goes five yards yeah. on, a, on a dry day where it hasn't rained and, and the course is in like great condition uh, and, it's, and, the, and the fairways are somewhat hard and you're getting these nice rolls. You could use the ground as like forgiveness like as long as i hit the ground like pretty pretty, i could go heavy into the ground here and it's i'm gonna have some forgiveness there but when the when it's wet and you're playing in the rain or it just rained you have to pick the ball clean or um you know you're you're gonna hit it super thin uh with a gap it's gonna go super high in the air and you're not gonna get that yardage whatsoever right yeah for sure um yeah so I, I'm not attending the tournament. Uh, my son's coming home, spending time with the family. This is going to be my first tournament that I'm missing. Uh, Chris and Phil and and Louie will be leading the tournament there. Uh, does does the group have it? I think last time or maybe a couple of years ago that we were we had a Freedom Invitational, and I'm bringing this up because um, there are there are thunderstorms in, in the in the forecast there, um, and we were called off the course. Uh, we certainly went back out there, but I think the conditions are calling for the same type of the same type of weather. Um, and Chris, what I'm what I'm noticing here is one, um, it's probably going to thunderstorm. You might get called off the course. You'll probably be able to go back out, right? There's, a, you know, it's a thunderstorm. It'll probably pass. Most likely, the group will be able to get out there. What do we do? I don't think we have this defined in the bylaws, but what do we do? One, if the delay goes, you know, way too long and you're not able, you're not going to be able to complete a round or uh, what do we do if, if you're not able to get it out there at all? Like what, what, how do you, how do you, how do we manage that situation? Back. Hey, hey, what's going on, Chris? Sorry, just doing a, uh, a quick mic check here on the, on the microphone. So can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, great. All right. Uh, let me adjust. You're at, what's you're- that? At a rain delay. Yeah, we we were talking about the rain delay. Where where'd you lose me there? I didn't. Uh, I didn't. The last thing I heard is we haven't. We don't have that in the bylaws. That what do we do if we? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so we're we're good to go from there. So yeah, what what do you think we should do? One, obviously, if it rains, we're certainly going to. Uh, or if it thunderstorms, you're going to be called off, and then everybody goes and has a couple drinks at the bar, maybe. Um, and then you get you obviously get back out there. Now the the tea times start at around one thirty. So if you get out there and you play for let's say two hours, it's three thirty, and then you have an hour delay. But if you get up to like a two hour delay, now you're looking at like five thirty, and it's the back nine. You're certainly gonna be crunching for a time. I, I, I think you're uh, pushing it with a two hour delay. If there's a two hour delay, everyone's leaving. Let's be honest. Um, you know, everyone's got. I I would like to say that we will all stay and finish it out, no matter what. But I think it's going to be a decision that you'll have to make. What? So how do you make that decision? How do how do I make it? Yeah, I, like like so you're I, saying like I'm definitely going to leave if there's a two hour delay. I mean, I think that everybody will. Personally. Sure, but but my my point is, how do you come to that decision? Like just because Chris Vittieri wants to leave or let's say just phil landoffy wants to leave right does every is everybody leaving now or what if everybody else wants to wants to play uh, right, so. i think i think if one person's just like you know what they called it i'm out he's just forfeiting that's fine i think i i don't think you can penalize him he showed up like i i understand the, the ronnie rule but it's different um that that's not a voluntary decision to stop um but I think if the so I think if like you said if at some at some point it need at some point it needs to be determined if it's a voluntary decision to stop right so if the thunderstorm delay is going to be like fifteen to thirty minutes and somebody's like oh I'm not I'm leaving right that's a voluntary decision right so I think I think there needs to be some type of definition maybe there's a time limit so why don't we yeah. just our uh, yeah that's what I'm saying how do we define that so just so it's clear in case it happens and there's no arguments all right well you know within the group. I think after, due to the timing being on a Sunday at one thirty, I think anything past, we'll say forty-five minutes. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go an hour and fifteen. 
I I think I think you're pushing it, honestly. Think just think outside the box right now, right? Think about um everyone's wife being at home with the kids. I'm not think I'm not thinking of everyone's wife. I'm not even thinking of my wife. Right? I then you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and I know the wrath I would get if I showed up two hours past what I even said to show up, which has an hour. You know, like if I show up at eight o'clock have five drinks in me, I'm probably going to get a world of. <laughs> well, yeah, mo- most of us would. Most of us would. I think I think that's the level of commitment that we're looking for in the league, though, is like we're going to make the tournament the most competitive. Um, so we, we could figure out the timing. I understand where you're coming from. Everybody has pressures and, and everybody's got places to be right. Whether you're married, right. whether you have a wife or not, everybody's got places to be things to do. Um, I'll tell you what I'm not leaving for to go pumpkin picking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, I, you gotta, <laughs> you, you have a tournament that day. Like you need to know, like you have a tournament. Are you not communicating with your wife? Like, Hey, I have a golf tournament on this day. I cannot go pumpkin picking. My it's, sister called me up. Especially if you're winning the tournament. It's Espe- just, yeah, especially if you're, especially if you're winning the tournament, Espe- like what a, you know, what a huge problem, no, especially if you're winning the tournament. If you know you're going to lose, all right, so bow out. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, no, don't bow out. You're you're expected to commit. You screw up the rest of the tournament if you bow out. Um, I mean, my sister called me, and I, I know she called me because Phil couldn't handle the situation. Uh, but she called me back in February and was like, I want to christen Jenna, her, their newborn daughter, uh, it, on June 7th. And I was like, I have a golf tournament that day. <laughs> and she was like i don't give a shit and i was like uh i'm not going to be able to make it i have a golf tournament that day phil doesn't have to come to the golf tournament but i have a golf tournament that day i might show up a little late um so and so that's why we put the tournaments out there um well in advance right we put them out in like february like here's the dates on the tournaments now is the time to speak up if there's anything major happening and maybe we can adjust the, uh, adjust the dates. But every year now, they're pretty much falling on the same dates. Plan around them. I mean, I plan to have my son in between the Summer Invitational and the Freedom Invitational. Um, and I, I, it worked out perfectly. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make the tournament because um, we you know, have some health issues with my son. But, um, and he's all healthy now. But my point is the commitment to the tournament is the most important. The commitment to maintaining the competitiveness of the, competitiveness of the league is uh, most important, Chris. So let's say let's say we decide that it's forty five minutes, right? And then yep. how 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 do we decide? Are we saying forty five minutes is the cutoff, and then the tournaments? I think that it's a group, I think then it's a group decision. Um, I think if it's called off, I think it also depends if if it's after nine holes. Uh, I think you might just use the nine hole round if it's before nine holes. I don't think you can rightfully award a winner. Um, at least after nine holes, you have enough score and you can, you can use all of your equation, just half of them, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I think, I think I'm in somewhat of an agreement here. So here, here are my thoughts. If it goes past nine holes, it's pretty late in the day. We're playing, if we were playing a morning round, I, I think I'd be, I, I would have less leniency with you on the time. Uh, but being that it's an afternoon round, at 45 minutes, here's what I'm going to propose. At 45 minutes, there's a check to see a weather check. And then if the if it's going to clear up within the next 15 to 20 minutes, group consensus, obviously commissioners and OGs are decision on this. If it's going to clear up within the fit next 15 to 20 minutes, um, you can you can plan on going out there. Uh, if not, then you're shutting it down at 45 minutes, right? Um, and then if it's if it's nine hole, if you've played more than nine holes total, and you can't be on hole nine, all nine holes must be completed. Uh, skins are distributed at that point. Any open skins are distributed at that point, uh, and the the, the points, uh, whoever's got the most points at that point, takes home the jacket, uh, which yep. I'm dropping off at Phil's today. By the way, uh, I'm gonna in fact right after this podcast, I'm dropping it off to Phil. Um, um, and then right after, so then it's nine holes or plus and 
that's that. Now, if there's a a short thunderstorm on the back nine and it's like, let's say you're at hole 15, 16, it's much later in the day at that point. Um, I, I think you're going to have to, what, what are you, we, how do we, now there's all these points that were accumulated on hole 12, you know, getting through 15. I think my suggestion would be that you're taking point totals from the, the last third hole. So let's say you make it past hole nine, right? And you're on yep. hole, you're on hole 11, right? The only scores, the only score tallies that count are holes nine, 12, 15, and 18. What okay. do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think we ran into that situation that one year where Carp won the tournament. Right? Yeah, where it, we had the it got too dark. Thing. Yeah, I, I think Bill was kind of blowing smoke up his ass a little bit. I totally think we could have gotten 17 and 18 in there. Like, he can't play two holes with, like, a green ball. He, his, his, Everybody was still competing. His boss is in the lead. And then, you know, we finished a hole, and Phil comes down clapping as loud as he could. Like, he was so happy that Mike Harp won. That, and that was the last time he cut, he clapped for Harp, to be honest with you. I hate to hate <laughs> slow you up there, Phil, with your boss. But um, I don't think he's ever been happy that he's invited Mike to the tournament, being that he, he dominated that one year. Um you know, I, I think talking about all the timings and where we have to go, it makes me think about when I was, you know, certainly when I had less responsibility, but just being able to go and go to go play around the golf, grab a couple beers after the round, or maybe just grab dinner with your friends or even with your wives, you know, meeting some of your friends, meeting some of your wives after the round. I feel like that culture has kind of disappeared, or maybe I'm just too old and, and, have too much responsibility right now this is that still a thing or are people doing that or is it pretty much get your round in and get your ass home and on onto everything else you need to do in life i think right now at this time it's get the round in go home um i think if the round was a little earlier we can we can swing it in addition i think we should plan it uh you know so much has to do with kids nowadays i mean carp ronnie me you phil uh uh, I don't even know who else says his Steve where you know, like everyone's got kids. Uh, I think a lot has to do with that and communication. I, I sound like a marriage. Believe me, I'm the last person. You sound <laughs> married. You sound yeah. I sound ridiculous, but you know what? It's, I, if you've been home with two kids for two days straight, it, oh, it's, 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 sorry, it, I, I get it. I, even just one yeah. kid, one kid by yourself for like two days straight. Like I'm, I'm, I have no hair for a reason. I've been there. Kids are exhausting. Yes. You need there to be there to support your wife, but why don't, why don't we do something? We should, we should either have a barbecue either. And it doesn't have to be every tournament, but uh, that, certainly the champions cup, we should definitely either have a, yeah, I, I agree with that. Right. Some type of outing or just where we get together with the families, maybe at like a picnic area where we're getting grills, everybody brings food. Like, yes, we're all responsible for it. Yes, our wives will obviously have to bring it there, but we'll be doing the grilling. All of our kids could play together. Right. Like, I, I just want to I want to take the league just out to, you know, get the, the wives involved, because if they start having fun, then um then they'll maybe let us play more golf. Right. Hopefully. And that's that's the goal here. Um so, yeah, all in all, I, I think, um, I, you know, I'd love to go to like, um, you know, Sunset Pub and Grill. That was like my favorite go to after golf spot in Morris County. In fact, um, I took my wife there on our on our second or third date. And apparently she fell in love with that was Yeah, it's a good place. Yeah. It's a nice outdoor uh, venue. Yeah, for sure. Love that place. Uh, a couple other places. Uh, I, I mean, even the bar over at Crystal Springs there, when you're playing at Wild Turkey, you got a nice view of the course and, and when, when the sun sets there. Um, I, I think there's a couple of places uh, on, on 23. Bally Owen's got a nice one. Bally yeah, Owen does have a nice nice little bar over there. It's a, it's a little little pricey, but it is Bally Owen, right? The number one yeah. public course in New Jersey. So, uh, yeah, all in all, let, let's try to get that together. Chris, I will uh, send out an email. I'll, I'll, I'll call Phil and Louie. And let's iron out this. Um, this if we if we have a weather delay this way, there's no uh, no yeah. problems there. I want to make sure that that works. All in all, uh, Chris, I'm gonna be. I'm not gonna be there, but I certainly want to communicate with you. Uh, if you follow Fast Company Golf on Instagram, also I'll be posting to Fast Company Golf and High Fade Society. If you could just funnel the scores to me, and I'll certainly get them posted as we progress along. 
uh, so everybody sees what's going on and uh, would certainly love to see uh, the champion take home the jacket. Unfortunately, I'm giving that away uh, this year. I'm certainly coming back next year strong as hell. I'm going to get my swing fixed up, maybe get a lesson, <laughs> maybe get customized clubs. We'll see. Um, Chris, uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, always yeah, a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And have a, have a great first day with your son. Yeah, yeah. First absolutely. day home with your son. Absolutely. Um, and just so everyone knows, um, Chris and I have a good time talking here, but uh, last week we had Jake on the podcast. I thought there was some pretty insightful stuff. We liked it so much. Uh, we're going to have, we're looking, we're in conversations with some other influencers out there who are looking to come on and, and uh, be guests on the podcast. Uh, it sounds like we're going to be bringing some coaches on as well. Um, so super excited about that. Super excited to expand the content. Uh, Chris, you probably don't know about this, but I've been able to get some of our podcasts and some videos up on YouTube now. So High Fade Society on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram. I'm going to be launching on SoundCloud pretty soon. Uh, and all of our podcasts are across all of the major pod platforms out there. So um, we're doing a great job, right? Um, our our viewership is expanding. Look at the data when you get a chance, Chris. And, um, you know, w things are just becoming more efficient for us. And uh, we do have um, a studio set up at this point, which is uh, pretty exciting. So, Chris, I'm looking forward to, to getting you in here and uh, just doing a live. Uh, yeah, this person. week. First, yeah. first live uh, podcast. All right. Let's make it happen. Hey, you have a good weekend, bud. You too. All right. Later. Have a good one.